I do want to get started on what is really a series. I, I didn't go into it thinking about it being a series, but what else do you call it? We're taking a look at the church, um, and specifically the church in the book of Acts. We didn't start that way either. This really started as a look at the church, uh, knowing it would go to the book of Acts, and here we are. Um, I don't intend to make it a verse-by-verse, blow-by-blow, story-by-story account. This is not some sort of audio commentary on Acts like we've done on other books of the Bible. Um, although at times it's going to feel that way because the church is the story of the book of Acts. It's the Acts of the Apostles, and the Apostles are those who are spreading that church to the world of their day. So. Um, really, and, and I, I don't want to beat this up every week, um, but I do want to say it at least enough to where it becomes part of what we know we're doing. We're not trying to reinvent anything. We're not trying to get a new understanding. We're not trying to prove what's right about the church or what's wrong about the church. This isn't some expose on how church should be done versus how church is being done. I, I don't think that's proper. Um, the reality is, is that church is an organism that grows and looks a lot like the people that are involved in it. And some places that's going to be a building with stained glass windows and, and choirs and, and liturgy and great. And in other places it's going to look very much like a, a basement of people who are meeting in private and are meeting Jesus together. Um, sometimes you're going to have preaching, sometimes you're going to have singing, sometimes you're going to have, take communion. Those things are what the church does. I don't think one of them makes the church, whereas the other one doesn't make the church. So that's not what we're trying to do. So what are we trying to do? We're just trying to discover what church looked like in the first century and, and, and recognize that we don't copy that, but we can learn from it. They made mistakes. They grew. Sometimes they grew slowly. Sometimes they exploded. Sometimes it looked like they were going backwards. Um, but they just continued to trust the resurrected Christ. The message of the early church is going to shine through in the book of Acts that this Jesus is alive. They keep saying it everywhere they go. This Jesus is alive. We really believe this. We've bought into this resurrected Christ. And that I want to see us get back to as the church, is Jesus is alive. All the other stuff that we do in church, we're going to find tonight in this lesson. This one's titled, They Cast Their Lots. This is going to be from chapter 1. That interesting moment pre-Pentecost where they cast lots for a 12th disciple. We're going to get into what that might have looked like and why that's important. But what we're going to find is that there are some things that happen in the book of Acts church that aren't real spiritual. They're in the Bible, but they're not real spiritual. It's not as if they had to go ask the Holy Spirit if they need to do that. And sometimes those actions didn't do a thing for the church. And sometimes those actions set them back a little bit. And sometimes those actions are reprimanded by the Spirit. And that tells me that they were just trying. And that's okay for us too. And that what we're doing as a church is just trying. We're just... Acts 1.15. Let's read a text. I want to start with one verse and I want to do a little bit of work from the Apostle Paul. Because I, I want to lay this out in a way that, that tries to... I don't, not, not an exegesis of this entire passage of Acts 1. But really to try to frame, get my mind around. Because this is one I've been wrestling with is what, what is the purpose of this whole last half of chapter 1? If you haven't done the work or read it, this is the moment where they decide they need to replace Judas Iscariot. Judas has committed suicide. They go, we need a 12th apostle. We need a 12th disciple. What does that look like and what does that mean to me? What does that matter to me? Acts 1.15 says this, In those days, Peter stood up in the middle of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120 and said. And I leave it with and said in a comma. I don't give you the next statement because I really just want you to see that parenthetical. And that parenthetical tells me that altogether the number of the names was about 120. And according to the previous verses, these are the disciples of Jesus, the brother of Jesus, the mother of Jesus. And then the Bible says his brothers and the women. And so this is not all males. This is not just the 12 in their sort of immediate circle. This is a, a diverse group of people who knew Jesus and who followed Jesus. But I want to show you something that I think is an interesting comparison. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to keep that 120 in mind. Paul says this in verse 3. I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This is, this is the Gospel that Paul preaches. And that He was seen by Kepha, uh, another name for Peter, and then he was seen by the 12, which is an interesting statement because Judas is dead. 
at the resurrection, Judas is already gone. So to say he was seen by the 12 seems to be a collective more than it is individ 12 individual people. The 12 being this idea of the disciples, though we know Judas can't be there, not if he's going to see the resurrected Jesus. After that, he was seen by, now notice this number. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present. Greater part to me means at least like 250, if not more of them, are still alive about 30 year, 25, 30 years after that incident, which is the resurrection. Some have fallen asleep, another an old English word for died. After that, he was seen by James, and then he was seen by all the apostles. Now notice the difference here. Seen by all the apostles is not the 12. Seen by the 12 would be the 12 disciples, minus Judas. So that's a group of people known as the disciples. And then by the apostles, which are those... Sometimes we try to mix up disciple and apostle, but there seem, there's a difference in the New Testament in the way that they listed these guys that, were, that ran with Jesus. So he's seen by apostles, that's others. Then last of, last of all, he was seen by me also, this is Paul, as by one born out of due time. And Paul saying it was as if... It was as if I were born in, the, in a different time, but I got to see him in the same way those did that walked with him on the earth. Paul, and you can love him or hate him. You can think he's nuts. You can believe him. You can do whatever. The decision is yours. Paul believed he saw the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. He didn't think he saw a phantom of Jesus. He didn't think he saw a mist of Jesus. He didn't have an emotional goosebump about Jesus. You asked Paul, he said, I saw him. I saw him as real as Peter and James and John saw him in that room on Sunday night after the resurrection. And that's why Paul built the whole basis of his new covenant theology on it. He's like, I've seen the resurrected Jesus. By the way, I know this is a side note, but that's why if you truly believe Paul, then you really got to take serious his resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, where he tells, uh, as this envelops, as he tells what a resurrected man looks like, that there's the dirt and then there's the heavenly. And he goes, Jesus wasn't this when I saw him. Jesus was that when I saw him, and that's where you're going. That's the life you're heading into. That's Paul's message. Now, why did we do this? I did this because I wanted you to compare two numbers. It was a lot of work to compare two numbers. What Acts chapter one say? There were 120 people that were waiting on the promise. That's the number that's gonna get us to Pentecost. 120 people in the upper room. But how many people saw him at one time in his resurrection? 500, plus, Kepha, plus the apostles, plus the disciples, plus all these others. So 600? The point is that between the resurrection and the time of Pentecost, 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension, last week we had Ascension Day. That's the day Jesus is enthroned, goes into glory. 10 days after that, Pentecost. That's this coming Sunday. Pentecost is the outpouring of the Spirit, Acts chapter 2. Okay, we're in this gap in Acts chapter 1 then between the ascension of Christ, the disappearance of Jesus, and between the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus up, Holy Spirit down. And in between is the end of Acts chapter 1, and we're down to 120 people. Do the math. How do we go from five or 600 people who saw him to only 120 people hanging on, waiting for the promise of the Father? And it tells me this. It is not always the case that when people encounter the resurrected Jesus, that when people have a revelation of Jesus, there's some sort of explosive growth outward and upward. And we've been taught that, that that's what church should always look like, that if it's going right, then things ought to blow up and grow. And all we're trying to do in these lessons is really just look at the church in the Bible and go, is that the right answer? And based upon Paul's number of people who saw, and I mean saw the resurrected Jesus, I'm not talking about heard about him. I'm talking they saw him. And then the number that's left that did what he said to do, which was wait for the promise of the Father. They lost like four-fifths of the church in 10 days. So the point is, if that was what was happening in the first century, that the church could see the resurrected Jesus and that just 10 days after an ascension to Pentecost, they were already down to sort of this core of 120, then it tells me that it doesn't mean that things are going wrong, that 
It's a disaster. It's not a move of God. If numbers trim, if we get smaller, and I don't see them panicking like we would. Because I promise you, we would panic in 10 days if we lost 80, 75 to 80% of the congregation between resurrection and the day of Pentecost. We would panic that we were doing something wrong. We had the false gospel. We needed to revamp our worship. We needed to tear stuff down. We needed to start over. And we don't see the early church bothering with that at all. What does that mean? I don't know other than maybe we should relax sometimes and just realize that the Holy Spirit does things His way and that we don't have to have this figured out, all right? And so when we're all experts about church growth and what the church ought to look like, I'm not saying it has to go from 600 to 120. I'm saying that the early church didn't lose their marbles when they went to 120. But can I put myself there for a moment? I probably would have. I probably would have freaked out and went, something's gotta change or we're gonna be dead. If we last 10 more days without something happening and we already went from 600 to 120, do the math, in 10 days, we're not gonna have a church left. And it always made me wonder, what were they thinking in that upper room, wherever and whatever that was, when they looked around and the numbers dwindling and thought, what happens if he delays this thing one more day? What happens if something doesn't happen? And uh, we don't know what their thoughts were, but I'm, I'm, I do find that pretty fascinating. Here's the whole story about the new disciple. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled. This is Peter talking. The Holy Spirit spoke it before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us, and he obtained a part in this ministry. Notice the parenthetical. We're going to come back to this in a moment. Don't worry if we fly through this, because we're going to come back to a couple of these. The parenthetical means that Luke, Luke, by the way, writes the book of Acts. Luke interjects his own thought into the text at, the, at verse 18. There's no more quotes here. It's because Luke is trying to give some commentary. This is being written after the fact. And so Luke drops in and goes, oh, by the way, Judas purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. And so Luke just gives this running commentary on what Judas did with the 30 pieces of silver. And I'm going to get to in a moment why there seems to be a bit of a disparage between Matthew's account and Luke's account. We'll talk about that as we go along. But that commentary is there and it became known. We're still in parentheses. Luke's still talking. It became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akodama, that is field of blood. I like Eugene Peterson calls it murder meadow, which I thought was pretty interesting. For it is written in the book of Psalms. I think this is Psalm 69. Let his dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in it. And then Peter jumps like 60 chapters later and grabs another line. Let another one take his office. These are two, two quotes that are not in the same song. Peter just grabs one from one song and he grabs one from another song and he applies them in his exegetical thought process. He applies them to Judas. 21. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. 24. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots. We're going to talk about that in a minute too. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Why? Why does this happen? What is the necessity of this? Let's talk about 12 first, because there's Hebrew numerology. It might not mean much to you, but I promise it meant a lot to them. Let's get into their context. In the Jewish numerological tradition, the number 12 represents totality, wholeness, and the completion of the purpose of God. Let me show you three biggies in their world. They had 12 tribes of Israel. That came from the 12 sons of Jacob. They took those numbers quite serious. They had 12 months on the Hebrew calendar. We have a very similar 12 month on the uh, Greco-Roman calendar, and then 12 houses of the Zodiac, which you might think, Big deal, right? Wrong. To the Hebrews, it was a very big deal because they actually believed they could tell the story of God's plan through the stars. Christianity has done that too, by the way, for about 17 or 1800 years at least. I mean, you have a virgin and a lion in the sky. You don't have to stretch real hard to make the gospel walk through the story of the constellations. And so that was big in the Hebrew numerology department 
So the 12 disciples likely saw themselves representing all of Israel. Why didn't Jesus pick 13? Nobody elbows him and goes, hey, you think we ought to have 14, 15? And there's always more than 12 people around Jesus, by the way. But there's the 12, a statement that come to mean these 12 guys who are on that inner circle. Because in the Jewish mind, if you were a rabbi, you had 12 elders around you. That's what literally made you a mini ecclesia. It made you a mini church was to have 12. And so they probably saw themselves as representing Israel. Though when we read the book of Acts, the spread of the gospel indicates that they were more like a new Israel. I think that's what Jesus is doing is surrounding himself with a people who are going to go out and multiply themselves on the earth. And I don't mean have babies. I mean make disciples and bring into the body of Christ through these 12 a new nation called the kingdom. Their ideas are Jewish in nature. They probably felt it was their need to bring back the number 12. Now I'm giving you speculation here. I'm just working off of history and what we think we know. What did you notice you didn't see happen in this chapter? God never stepped in and said... You guys need 12th disciple. Now, I know we can make arguments from silence and it's not a good idea to do because it's not fair because we don't actually know. But you can take what you know and then you can take what you don't know. Or in this case, you can take what you hear and you can take what you don't hear. What you hear is Peter going, we got to have another disciple. We got to have a 12th guy that saw Jesus and they got to be a part of this group and we're going to go ask the Lord to show us and how are we going to ask the Lord to show us? We're going to cast lots, which is, by the way, guys, really darn close to short a straw gets it. Like, here's a bunch of straws, pick. And the shortest straw wins. And that's literally how the first iteration of the church in Acts 1 chooses this, what they feel is absolutely necessary, 12th disciple. Did you do any research this week and go look up that disciple, how many times does he get mentioned after Acts 1? Just in case you didn't know this, zero. <laughs> the early church never mentions him again. Now that might not be fair. It's not as if they mention all 12 disciples again over and over and over again. But I find it interesting that the first real major point of emphasis for the early church, we got to have that 12th disciple, and yet that 12th disciple isn't mentioned anywhere in what they do. Let's try to figure out why that is. Go back to the story. 24, 25, 26. Here's their prayer. You, Lord, know the hearts of everyone. Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. We'll get to Judas. Just want to get to this following of the Spirit. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. They literally... It's pretty close to gambled, pretty close to rolling dice, picking numbers, draw the short straw, flip a coin. You only got two choices. Matthias, maybe. Justice, the other guy, maybe. Which one's it going to be? The lot falls on Matthias. This is pre-Pentecost. And I don't want to belabor this point, but this is necessary, man. You live in a post-Pentecost world. It's the only thing we've ever known. From the moment you were conceived, you lived in a world saturated by the Holy Spirit, whether you realize it or not. This is something that I don't think the church gives enough thought to. While we're so busy in the church talking about the world going to hell in a handbasket and sins taking over and all this problems in the world, it's as if we've ignored the fact that the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost 2,000 years ago and He never went anywhere. He is still here. And now that might lead you to say, well, then I'm very disappointed in the Holy Spirit. The world ought to be a better place by now. And what that tells me is that I don't know that we really understand why the Holy Spirit was poured out in the first place. You see, Jesus took all of the sin and the evil in the world into himself at the cross, and it was judged. I don't mean God went on the war path against Jesus. I mean God went to work on the sin of the world at Calvary, and it met its end in Christ. Now, People still fail, people still sin, people still make mistakes. The world is still a violent and a mean and an awful place. But because of Jesus and His resurrection and our faith in Jesus and our baptism into Jesus, and I know I'm putting a lot of theological concepts there, but because of these things, you and I get to taste the kingdom to come in the world that is. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it's already being done in heaven. 
And so that you and I are getting to participate in what happens in the heavenly in the present. And that can only happen because of the agency of the Holy Spirit who has been poured into the church. And because of that, we are not in the dark. Because of that, we don't walk in superstition. Because of that, we don't cross our fingers. Because of that, because of the Holy Spirit, we don't have to wait until the moon and the sun line up in a certain hour, and we don't have to wait until a certain feast day, and we don't have to offer up a certain blood sacrifice. Everywhere we go, all of the time, we have the internal identification of the Holy Spirit, and all we have to do is talk to the Father. We don't have to go to the priest. We don't have to go to the temple. We don't have to shed blood. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to drop money in the offering plate. We don't have to live up to the standard. We don't bring our brownie points to the Lord and say, have we done enough, jumped high enough, accomplished enough in order for you to bless us? We are not in a covenant of performance. We are in a covenant of promise and it is based upon Christ. And the reward we get is that we are no longer orphans. We are not alone. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. You are not looking at that in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is a great glimpse of what the church would look like without the Holy Spirit. In other words, we might be just as well off to see if we draw the short straw. Because we can't ask the Holy Spirit, or at least we don't know how to listen. Now watch how it changes. This is just an example. I'm going to give you three examples from Deeper in Acts. I know you're not going to understand any of these stories. That's okay. I'm not trying to teach these stories. I'm showing you the phrase. Watch how the phrase changes. Because right here, Peter goes, Lord, you, you, you help us pick. And then he doesn't wait around for God to go this one. He goes straight to his coin flip. Help us pick, Lord. Heads or tails. Boom, boom. Oh, it's Matthias. Let's move on. And then we forget about Matthias because it kind of tells me, I don't know how much the Lord was in that. You want to watch what happens when the Lord's in it? Acts 13. In the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and there was also Saul too. As they ministered to the Lord and they fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent him away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Well, that looks a whole lot different than flip a coin, see if we get justice or Matthias. By Acts 13, the Holy Spirit is actively picking disciples, actively picking apostles and using the church as an instrument. Here's another one, Acts 15, 28. James says this at the council in Jerusalem. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. By Acts 15, at the midway point of the early church, they have figured out that if they're going to make a decision, they need to make it on the back side of the Holy Spirit, not in front of Him. It took them to Acts 15 to figure this out, by the way. This is the first time they ever come up with the phrase, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. It's not just it seemed good to us, but it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Look at what chapter you're in. There's only 28 chapters, guys. It took them over halfway before they realized we ought to consult the Holy Spirit on this stuff. This is why I say to people when they go, I want our church to be like the book of Acts. This is why I say, which chapter? <laughs> because you got over half the book where they don't, they, don't, they don't say stuff like this. So careful. when. Actually, I'll say this. Your church already is like the church of the book of Acts. You just aren't probably in the chapter you want to be. Odds are you're out here playing with superstitions and short straws in chapter 1, not listening to the Holy Spirit. There's a really good chance that your church is living there because we've, we've all done some of that. Just kind of throw this against the wall and see what sticks. I don't know what's going to happen. Just you know, let's try a bunch of stuff, see what goes on. Do you, don't you think we ought to ask the Lord what He wants to do? Well, you know, He'll show us. After, <laughs> after we run over all this stuff and knock this stuff down, He'll show That's flip the coin. You know, that's like, ah, God, whichever way it lands, that's the way God wants it to be. Will of God's been done, and we just sort of always move forward with it. But there's a better way to live. We don't have to live that way. Here's another one, Acts 16, 6. When they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were, for, look at this, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they come to Mysia, they tried to go to, the, to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. By, by chapter 16, the Holy Spirit's getting active in the church going, don't go there. Do go there. Pay attention. You're not just out here throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. It's not just here a little, there a little evangelism. It's focused as you listen to the Holy Spirit. It's not a scatter shot of the gospel. It's a laser shot of the gospel. And the only way that's going to happen is if we become sensitive to the Spirit. How do we get here? 
Well, of course, that's 15 chapters from where we are, but I'm doing all of this to show you that there's baby steps in our development of who we are as a church. And that's okay, because you know what? He doesn't shut them down at the end of Acts 1. This whole superstitious flip a coin, see what God picks, you would think that, that garbage ought to get them shut down. God ought to step in right there and go, We're not, this ain't the way this is going to work. We're going to get rid of this. But he doesn't. He's, sent, he's, he's gentle with them. He's a rushing mighty wind. He's going to come in and he's going to move through the agency of the Holy Spirit. But they don't always nail it. So pre-Pentecost, the church leans more to what we would call superstition than to the Spirit. Or maybe a throw it against the wall and see what sticks attitude. The decisions they make in Acts 1 do not look like the decisions they make later. I showed you a little bit of that in Acts 13, in Acts 15, in Acts 16. And certainly as you get deeper into the book of Acts. This is not only a sign that the early church was growing, it's also a sign that ought to teach us that our quote-unquote fleshly activity, the stuff going on in the church that we swear, that we, you know, as we grow up, we go, that was the flesh. And believe you me, there's a lot of junk that we're doing in a church that doesn't have any Holy Spirit-led activity to it. But it shows us that that's not unique. But we also don't ignore it like it doesn't matter. In other words, we're going to have stuff go on in our, serv in our churches and in our services that are certainly not moves of the Spirit. We don't shut the church down and throw it out and condemn it. The early church had things going on in chapter 1 that were not a move of the Spirit. But we live in a post-Pentecostal world which tells me that we ought to be growing. That it's not enough of an excuse to just go, oh, you know, well, we're human, so, you know, mistakes happen. Because that's the kind of thing that ends up getting a lot of mistakes swept under the rug or ignored or that gets us to where we don't ever really ask the Holy Spirit what ought to be done. We just assume that if it works, it was God, and if it fails, it's the devil. By the way, that's a bad way to live your life. If it works, it's God. If it fails, it's the devil. Because a lot of times we'll attribute a lot of things to God that work in the beginning. And in my, this work on Jonah, which, by the way, I put the last word to chapter 12 last week. So we're down to the conclusion. I mean, we're down to a few hundred words and that thing's done. But if you judge everything based on opportunity and availability, ooh, that's God. You'll get to Joppa and there'll be a boat going to Tarshish with an empty seat and a ticket at the ticket counter. And you'll buy that ticket and get on that boat and go, God changed his mind. He don't need me to preach to Nineveh. This is good living, man. I found a boat going where I needed to go. And you'll be so confident that it means God's will has changed that you'll get on the boat and fall asleep in the middle of a storm that scares sailors to death. That's not rest in the middle of your goodness. That's apathy in the middle of your chaos. And we do that a lot of times and call it God because something worked. It's, it's, we don't just, that's flipping a coin, man. That's draw the short straw. See what happens. Is there some of that in our walk? You're lying to yourself if you don't think there is. There's some of that in all of our walk. There's a little bit of that. Okay, let's, just, uh, let's hope this works. But that's not the end of our journey. We're growing past that. We're growing through that, or at least we ought to be. Here's a New Testament example of what I'm talking about through an epistle I, which is Paul, 1 Timothy 4. I use NRSV here. I think it just lands a little closer. Verse 7 and 8 of 1 Timothy 4. Have nothing to do with profane myths and old wives' tales. Train yourself in godliness, for while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The reason I put this up is verse 7 widely felt to be the New Testament verse on superstition and fable. In other words, and, and, and what I mean by why that's widely considered is they didn't have a word for the word we're looking for, but Paul comes close. These myths and old wives' tales don't belong in your walk. And so we're not just trying whatever. We're actually exercising godliness. Now, exercising godliness train yourself in godliness doesn't mean train yourself to be godly you're already god's children okay but we exercise our godliness by running away from the things that do not speak to our godliness so we got myths and fables we've got stuff that doesn't follow the spirit but we follow after it and it takes exercise to walk away from that i think it actually takes 
a constant spiritual exercise, a spiritual discipline of following the Holy Spirit over following the whims of whatever is laid in front of us. And we do that by continuously practicing, which means, practice means you're going to fail. So we continuously practice following the Holy Spirit by allowing ourselves to mess up once in a while. This is why the church cannot be a place of condemnation. Not if we want people to take the journey. If you don't want people to take the journey, condemn the fire out of them because you'll run them off. Because who wants to take the journey when somebody gets beat up every step they take? But if you want people to take the journey with you, and you then you don't condemn them but you don't run over them when they fall down. You pick them up when they fall down and you go, we, we can do this. We can do better than this. And I kind of think that's the church of Acts 1. We're not going to do this lot cast in business anymore. We're not going to cast lots to see if Paul gets Barnabas or Mark. By the time we get to there, they say, let's go talk to the Holy Spirit. Why are they done with short straw living? By Acts 15, 16, 13, 15, 16. Because they have the internalization of the Holy Spirit. And they realize that's a way better way to go. And you have the internalization of the Holy Spirit. So don't just rely on the exterior. Don't just rely on emotion. Don't just rely on what happens around you. That is the mark of an immature church. And, and, we're more, and you're more mature than that. And we as a collective group are more mature than that. And the ability to be able to hear the Holy Spirit and what he says. Let's talk Judas and we'll get to the close. Here's the middle of Peter's little sermon. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled. Now this is interesting. Because Peter takes a verse from one psalm and a verse from another psalm. And he sort of builds a, you could almost call it a Frankenstein theology in Acts 1. And I just mean that parts from two different chapters. And he says it had to happen this way, which is interesting because we're going to see if there's possibly a counter argument to that. The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Judas became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. This is early. This is probably written. This is possibly written. Mm, that's a real scholarly debate. But it's very possible that Luke pens this before Matthew, at least, at least the version of Matthew that we see. We don't know that. But it's interesting that Luke's version is, is that Judas becomes a guide to the people who arrest Jesus. He was numbered with us. He obtained part in the ministry. He purchases a field with the wages of iniquity. There's a little bit of a conflict here with the Matthew side of the story. Because in Matthew's version of the story, Judas comes back into the temple. He brings the 30 pieces of silver. And he goes, I didn't know you were going to arrest him. And he throws the 30 pieces of silver at them. And the Bible says that they won't take it. Because it's the price of blood. And so the last thing we see is Judas runs out of the temple. The, the coins are on the floor of the temple and, and Judas leaves. And the next thing we know, he kills himself. But we don't really know what happened to that money. Matthew says that they sweep it up and they go out and buy the, what's called the potter's field, which is a fulfillment of the Zechariah 11 prophecy that with the 30 pieces of silver, they would buy the potter's field. And the potter's field is... Uh, the, the place that they bury the, the unknown, the stranger. It's a place of broken pottery. It's, it's, it's a trash heap. But then Luke, in the book of Acts, says that Judas bought it. Is this a conflict? I don't really think so. Because this could be where we get the English etymology, he bought the farm. We don't think it is. We, we call he bought the farm like this World War II phrase, where planes were testing and they would go down in fields and the government would have to come in and pay for the rebuilding of barns and everything. That's what etymologists will tell you bought the farm means, that the government had to come in and buy your farm because they lost a million dollar plane in the backyard. <clears throat> but we got evidence that it's way older. And I've read a couple of scholars who actually believe that the old English bought the farm is picked up from Judas buying the field and dying in the field that he bought. And so the phrase bought the farm meant you took the blood money in. You took that, bought the place of your death and died there. So to say bought the farm is to die, maybe not necessarily at your own hand, but to die in your place. Um, I personally think that when they scooped up the money to fulfill Zechariah 11 and went out and bought the field, Judas goes into the field by hanging himself in the field 
it becomes as if Judas bought the field. In either case, Akodama, field of blood, potter's field, is at the very edge of the Valley of Gehenna, the Vale of Hinnom. What is the Valley of Gehenna? It is the Greek word that gets translated, time out, rewind. It is the Greek word that gets mistranslated into the English as the English word hell. There is no Greek word for hell. The Greek word used for hell is Gehenna. Gehenna was a fiery trash heap at the edge, at the south side of Jerusalem. The flames never died. The smoke lifted from Gehenna forever. And the worms constantly ate the bodies of the strangers thrown into the Valley of Hinnom. The field of blood, Akeldama, literally sets at the slope leading into Hinnom. In Acts chapter 1, it says that Judas falls and his bowels gush out and fall into the field that he bought, meaning that what was in Judas gushed out and fell into what the New Testament calls hell. The, blood, the money used to betray Jesus was then used to buy a field full of brokenness so that the Jesus that goes to the cross can go into your brokenness and buy you out. And this is a theology the early church ran with for hundreds of years. This idea that what happens at Calvary is played out in miniature in Judas because what's inside of his intestines? Now you're thinking food and drink, but what's really inside of his intestines? Go back to the Last Supper. Jesus tears bread and pours a cup of wine and slides it across the table at all of his twelve. And in that room is Judas Iscariot, who takes and eats and drinks. And the Bible says, and after they ate and drank, Jesus said to him, go do what you do. So did Judas take communion? Yes. What's inside of Judas when he hangs himself at the field of blood? But the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus that gushes out onto the ground. Why am I asking you all of this? Why am I bringing all of this? Well, part of the reason I bring it up is because I... I want you to see that the redemption for Judas is in Judas. That Jesus is paid for Judas's redemption before Judas even fails. That that's how good your God is. That he slides across to you the very thing that will save you. And you take it into yourself and maybe you do good with it and maybe you don't do good with it. But it is his body and it is his blood. And then we can argue about what happens to them for eternity. But we can't argue that what happens to the Judas of the Bible is that his guts fall out into the field that Jesus paid for. <laughs> and what happens to Judas? Revelation 21, 14, the New Jerusalem. The walls of the city of New Jerusalem have 12 foundations. And on those 12 foundations are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And I leave you with this question. Is the 12th foundation stone of the New Jerusalem etched Matthias? Or is it etched Judas Iscariot? And in one of the great mysteries of eschatology the Bible refuses to answer and I think it is so that you and I have to live with the determination of what is the foundation of the new Jerusalem what is the foundation of the kingdom of God I'm not gonna answer this for you I'm just gonna give you a couple things to think about is the 12 is the 12th foundation stone of this this New Jerusalem, a superstitious, draw the short straw, flip a coin, land where it may, or is the foundation the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus taken into all of us betrayers and traitors and spilled onto the purchased ground of the field of blood? Is our 12th cornerstone of the new kingdom built on the superstitious machinations of a pre-Pentecost church and a choice of a man who never gets named again? Or is it Jesus hanging between heaven and earth, nails in his hands and his feet, just before the spear pierces his side? And he says to God, Father, forgive them, 
They know not what they do. I ask you, is it possible that Jesus isn't thinking about the Romans? Jesus isn't thinking about the Jews? Jesus isn't thinking about Caiaphas. He is thinking about Peter, the denier, and Judas, the traitor. And I really hope that's what he's saying. Because I didn't put him on the cross, but I denied him. I didn't condemn him to die, but I've betrayed him. Father, forgive Paul. He just doesn't know what he's doing. On that kind of redemption, maybe the new Jerusalem is built. What's it mean for us? Well, maybe it means we should cut ourselves some slack. Maybe we don't make all of our decisions as informed as we think they are, that, that they should be, and maybe we should cut slack to the other places that do the same. At the same time, maybe it means that we should be maturing in this, growing up a little bit. The decisions we make today are reflective of where we are today, but they're not reflective of where we're going. And that's okay. Maybe we should cut ourselves some slack. I think that the church of Acts 15 would have looked back and shook its head on the church of Acts 1 and would have went, remember that time we picked a disciple by using the short straw system? <laughs> what were we thinking? We don't even talk about that 12th disciple anymore. I'm not even sure the Holy Spirit was in that. Maybe. But I can tell you this. You're not going to do much in the Acts 15 church if you keep dragging your guilt of your Acts 1 church with you. So whatever you did yesterday, it's time to let that thing go. What you were a part of, it's time to let that go. And if I've learned anything, it's my past is mine. But the best thing I can do with it is just fertilize somebody else's tomorrow because I can't live there. And you can't either. Good, bad, or ugly. You can't live there. And gladly, Pentecost is coming around the corner. We get to leave the Acts 1 church behind. This is growth. That's what it is. It's ugly. Growth's ugly. Toddlers spit all over themselves and poop in their pants and throw food all over the kitchen. Growing up's ugly. That's just the baby part. Wait till they become teenagers. You know? All right, that's enough. Part. Let's pray. I want you to just dwell with me for a second on this. I, I don't, you know, casting their lots was like an old Hebrew thing for, I mean, it was literally. Maybe, and I'm not going to tell God what he can and can't do because it does look like in the Bible that casting their lots would end up where it should. Jonah gets thrown out of the boat because they cast lots and it ends up on Jonah. And I do believe the Lord can use whatever he wants to. And I do not tell the Father what he can and cannot do. That's a good idea. But you're better than throw it against the wall and see what sticks. All right? Let's pray in that manner. Father, I don't know what all of your kids tonight have in their life that looks a little bit like the casting of lots. And I don't know what we all have in our life that needs a whole lot more than that. But whatever it is, I believe that lessons like this are going to equip us to say, I am better than just flip a coin and see where it lands. I have the Holy Spirit. I am better than draw the short straw and call it God. I am better than just taking my chances. I believe I have the ear of the Father and I'd like to learn how to use it. And Lord, tonight... I don't know if we're right about Judas. I don't know if we're right about the cornerstone, but it makes you look big, and I like stuff that make you look big. And I don't want to get before you someday and you say, why'd you make me so little? Because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get before you someday and you're going to say, whoa, why'd you make me so big? And for that, Father, tonight, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.